Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Everyday Musician Podcast. This is episode 21. Welcome to the Everyday Musician Podcast with Eric Mugala, a violinist based in Massachusetts interested in talking to everyday musicians doing amazing things. This week on the podcast, we have Nate Taylor, a freelance cellist in the Boston area. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Everyday Musician Podcast. I have Nate Taylor here right in front of me in the room, in the flesh. How are you, man? I'm good, man. A little tired, but excited to be here. Yeah, man. So um, for those of you who don't know Nate, he is a uh, uh, great personality and he's a fantastic cellist. And uh, Nate, let's talk about your journey in cello and journey in classical music, uh, starting from the very beginning. Oh, wow. The very beginning. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the very beginning, but, you know, like maybe in recent history, like the past 10 years. Okay. 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 Um, so within the past decade, let's see. Um, so I am a... Uh, artist diploma student at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. Um, and I've actually been a student at BOCO for the past, um, going on eight years now? Wow. Uh, yeah, I entered BOCO as a tiny freshman in 2011 with and, Eric, actually. Yeah, yeah and, and that's how we met. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how we met. <laughs> been friends ever since. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, as of recent, I would say I've I've been very fortunate and blessed to have a lot of great opportunities, um, like um, winning the concerto competition um, in 2017 um, and then getting into Tanglewood Music Center um, that year as well. Um, that year kind of sort of um, snowballed into a lot more opportunities uh, following that. Um, I got invited to Tanglewood again and went there again um, this past summer in 2018. And uh, I was also um, accepted into the Orpheus Fellowship Program, uh, which was really awesome, uh, which gives me a lot of opportunities to play with Orpheus and um, just um, just really get to know how the organization of Orpheus itself works and its entity. Um, yeah, and Orpheus is, is in New York, New York, right? Yes, yes, it's in New York City. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about your recent experience in Tanglewood, mm-hmm. your past two summers in Tanglewood. Mm-hmm. I got to see you perform at Tanglewood, mm-hmm. and uh, my mom, I'm honored as a friend to see you perform as principal cellist of the Tanglewood Orchestra, so that was a really great treat to, to see you perform along with some other friends. Uh, describe, your, describe your experience. What, what was the festival like? What, um, what did you gain from the festival? Mm-hmm. So um, with the Tango and Music Center, um, it's a fellowship program, and basically uh, it's eight weeks of very intensive music making. Um, at the highest level. Yeah, of course, at, at the highest uh, possible level. Um, we get to work with a lot of great conductors. Like um, Obviously, we get to work with the BSO because Tango is their summer home. Um, so we get to work with uh, Andres Nelson, the principal conductor, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also any... Um, any of my shows that they happen to bring through Tangerwood, some of them will come through to uh, TMC and conduct us in various performances. Um, like one of the highlights uh, from my past summer uh, there was definitely for sure uh, with Nelson's conducting us in Heldenleben. Um, I was sitting principal for that concert, and and I got to see that concert too. That was really great. That was in Ozawa Hall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in Ozawa Hall. Um, first time ever crying on stage. <laughs> just going to put that out there. Um, just because of the emotional energy and the intensity, um, not just of the music, but just like um, the amount of energy that everyone was like giving off, you know, on stage, like during the performance, it was like really, really powerful. Um, and also another highlight was uh, Maestro Herbert Blumstedt in Brahms 4, which really changed my um, perspective um, of orchestral playing. Um, just because his ideas about Brahms. I mean, one, this this guy didn't use a score at all. And he had so a little... So he conducted it memorized. Yeah, he conducted the uh, the entire symphony or the whole concert, honestly, from memory. Um, and, you know, he was so knowledgeable about Brahms and how to interpret his music. Um, but also he was just, like, a really, like, down-to-earth, humble, like, super funny guy. Like, I feel like he's, like, a... F- you know, like a 10 year old trapped in a 93 year old man's body. (laughs) Like he's like so full of energy. Like, you know, when the first day of rehearsal with him, I remember him walking out and uh, he saw a stool on the, on the podium 
and he looks over to the stage manager like, um, excuse me, can someone remove this uh, this podium off of the or uh, this stool off of the podium? So the guy comes and uh, removes it off the podium. Yeah. And then under his breath, um, he says, you know, stools are for old people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, mind you, he had just turned uh, 92 or 93, I don't remember, like a few days prior to that. So wow. that's how legendary this, this uh, man is. Um, and I was, I was very humbled and privileged to play under his baton. Incredible, incredible story. So let's talk about um, the training that you got. Mm-hmm. What, what did your days look like? And how long were your days when you were a fellow for the mm-hmm. past few summers? Oh, man. Because you, uh, based on the conversations you and I had, they were like long days. So describe like, uh, like a regular weekday at Tanglewood. How much playing would you be doing and how much rest would you be getting? Probably not a lot. Yeah, it's it's interesting actually, Tanglewood, um, because um, the schedule is pretty consistent um, on a regular basis, although it does switch. Um, but I would say, um, I mean, in the beginning, when string players at Tanglewood get uh, there, uh, basically, it's the first two weeks is just strictly string quartet music. So it's we uh, we call it quartet seminar or quartet workshop. And basically what it is, it's the first two weeks we have to learn, like, two string quartets in, like, two weeks and then perform it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that in itself, like, those two weeks were probably the longest and hardest days at Tanglewood because it was – we would have uh, three hours of coaching every day, um, you know, two to four hours of our own rehearsal time as a group, um, then, of course, individual practice time, um, and then master classes at night. Um, and when I tell you that the, the first two weeks, both summers were some of the most intense <laughs> experiences of my life, I'm... You're, you're not lying. Uh, no, no, no. I do not exaggerate <laughs> at all. It was, I mean, it was super rewarding because we got coached by uh, the Juilliard Quartet. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like, their, their knowledge and everything is uh, amazing. And to be able to work with them and being, be coached by them is amazing. Um, but man, those days were so long. <laughs> those days were so long. <laughs> yeah, man. I remember talking to you about those days. I think you and I were maybe texting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, Hey man, like I just finished. And like, I look at the time, it's like nine thirty, ten 10 PM. And you started at 8 AM probably. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's dive into your Orpheus fellowship. So for the people who are new to the podcast, of course, uh, welcome and for people who are not familiar with Orpheus, just describe what Orpheus is. Like, what is their mission? What is their goal? So the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra is uh, a conductorless chamber orchestra, uh, one, of the world's most, uh, one of the world's most renowned uh, chamber orchestras um, in the world. Uh, they, they've been in existence for a long time. Uh, they're all super nice people, um, but they also play at a very, very high and mature level. Um, so what do you mean by mature level? Um, so when I, when I say uh, a mature level, it's, uh, it's interesting because with uh, the way rehearsals with Orpheus work, it's actually very, um, very spastic, very like all over the place because um, everyone is considered equal um, in, in the group. Um, so everyone has equal input, um, which um, I think is a good thing um, just because you can get all these different perspectives and all these different... Um, ideas, um, and it's sort of. I think that's what makes Orpheus like so unique, is because all the individual um, entities contribute not just musically, physically, but also mentally um, to uh, the music and to the process uh, as well. So there's not that level of hierarchy that there normally would be in an orchestra. If you're sitting in the back of the, back of the section, mm-hmm. you still have equal say as the concertmaster, perhaps. I would say, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Great. So, um, so have you performed with Orpheus yet, or not yet? Not yet. Um, I'm hoping to soon. Um, with the fellowship, it really depends on their schedule, and you know, if they ask me to do things, obviously, I'm going to say yes. Because um, you're the fellow. Yeah, of course. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with uh, with Orpheus, um, I just mostly 
um, participate in the rehearsals. Um, so I play in the cello section for uh, various rehearsal cycles that they have. Um, like the last one uh, I played in, uh, it was actually interesting because Stephen Isserlis was soloing uh, with Orpheus. And um, I actually didn't, I didn't play in the concerto, but um, I played in the other pieces that were on that program. Um, but during the, uh, when they were rehearsing the concerto with Isserlis, like they, they asked me um, to go listen, like go out in front of the orchestra and listen. <laughs> and um, I'm just sitting there like thinking to myself, like, okay, like I know this is how they do things. Like they obviously want like an ear out in, in front of the orchestra to check balance and stuff. But in the back of my mind, I'm just like, they're basically asking me to like judge Stephen Isserlis. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not about to do that. <laughs> I'm not about that life. No, 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 not at all. Um, I mean, I of course I you know gave um, my my honest uh, a critique of uh, your mature <laughs> your mature opinion. Of course, I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's it's funny because they just sometimes they'll put me on the spot, no. and and they know they they know that I don't like that. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's good because it uh, sort of gets me out of my shell. Um, but kind of forces you to grow too. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course, it um, forces you to grow. Um, and it's actually interesting for me, too, because I can really gauge how they're communicating with each other when I go out and listen. Um, obviously, I can hear other, how everyone's ga- um, engaging each other um, playing in the orchestra, but playing out in, or um, listening out in front of the orchestra, it, um, it definitely gives me a different view of um, how they communicate uh, during a performance. So. Excellent. Thank you for all of that. So for the for the past few minutes, we've been talking about how uh, you've been you're 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 continuing to educate yourself on everything about the cello, about classical music, about any kind of music. And you and I are in the freelance world where we are professionals. We're playing in a variety of settings and a variety of gigs. Where do you see classical music in 10 years? You and I are in the freelance scene uh, pretty frequently, and we also play a lot of gigs together. We played a gig... um, Like a week or two ago. Like week, Yeah, yeah, a week or two ago, right? And it was for some kind of soundtrack movie in Malaysia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the freelance scene, classical music, and the the career of of a musician is changing every day. Mm -hmm. So what are you noticing that could be the future or perhaps uh, what you would like to change, like if you were to be like the a head of an organization, mm. and you had the opportunity to be like, okay, I want to make this kind of change because it's going to help either the organization or the classical music uh, business or classical music in general. Like, what would those things be? Um, I guess for starters, I would say um, to the conservatories and music schools out there, um, I would say I would want to change how um, the curriculum uh, in terms of uh, teaching us how to be successful after school. Because oftentimes uh, what we often see is uh, people will leave, you know, conservatory and they'll start taking auditions and doing all this stuff and they're just, you know, not, it's just not happening. Uh, It's not not the way the world works anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just not happening uh, like that anymore. And... And, you know, this is this is one of the things that I wish um, I had learned uh, in school was, you know, how to be a professional, like, after school. You know, because they kind of just, you know, and not, not just um, our school, but, you know, a lot of music schools tend uh, to just, you know, drill into your head that you need to play well, you know, to be, you need to be perfect, you know, you need to be all this, and you'll be, you know, successful in, you know, orchestra, chamber, solo, whatever. But there's the, the business side or the business aspect of it um, or the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial aspects of it. We don't get taught that in conservatory. And those were skills that, uh, and Eric, I'm sure you can relate this too, those are skills that we had to learn on our own, you know, just being thrown uh, out, you know, basically out to the wolves, basically, uh, or out to the dogs. And, um, yeah, it was, (laughs) I mean, at least for me, uh, it was, that was a struggle, man. And it was um, definitely a huge wake-up call. So Uh, that was an an answer for the musicians listening to the podcast. Now, for the non-musicians who are joining us for the podcast, what can you say about classical music um, that will get them into the into the concert hall? They might not have um, gone to a classical music concert ever before. Mm-hmm. So what 
inspires you to be a performer mm -hmm. and um, a lover of classical music? Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, bottom line for me is because the music is it's relatable to me. You know, it's not just, you know, black and white notes on a page. Um, you know, this music that we're so lucky and uh, fortunate and blessed to play um, every day, um, you know, the composers of this music, like, put, you know, their, you know, their hearts and souls and, you know, their, their time and blood, sweat, tears, you know, all that stuff, you know, into, you know, their compositions. And, you know, for me, that's so relatable because... I'm such a passionate person, and I put so much passion into my music making and my cello playing um, because, you know, I'm very in tune with uh, with my emotions, and I channel those emotions whenever I play, depending on uh, the piece that I'm playing. And, you know, a lot of these pieces, you know, are can be described as like journeys, um, destinations, um, life lessons, you know, like the Franck Sonata, you know. <laughs> Dude, don't even get me started on Franck Violin Sonata, <laughs> man. It's, it's such a great piece of music, but it's so difficult to play. Yeah. Yeah, because there's so much emotion. But also, you bring up an interesting point where you have a where you have a piece of music for all, that's been around for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and you go uh, what's been played through tradition. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you're approaching a piece of music that has been around for a very long time, how um, how do you approach it? What is the thought process of making this existing piece your own? Um, well, first and foremost, getting to know the composer. Yeah. Duh. It's like before I start any piece, I got to know what the composer is about, you know, when it was written, you know, if there's a story behind it, any, you know, quotations from other composers, you know, stuff like that. Um you know, and then I really just, like, try and sit down and think about it harmonically, uh, melodically. Um, I don't listen to recordings, uh, at least anymore. I mean, when I was a teenager, I would, like, listen to recordings all the time just so I could, like, learn the piece and, you know, see what what I like. Yeah, and recordings could uh, be a useful thing when you're stuck um, on a certain passage and you're mm. trying to look for ideas. And I, feel, I find that with recordings, for me, there are... Um, it's a it's a great tool to use to see what other people have thought of, and then you kind of just you kind of take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, and then once um, once once I figure out the piece harmonically and melodically, and then um, once I figure out the notes under my own fingers, then that's where the magic really starts to happen when uh, you start trying to tell a story. And as a performer, you're not only just performing the music because you know, it's your job and you have to, but you also have to realize that as a performing artist, like you're performing in front of an audience, you know, they took time, you know, money, effort to, you know, come see you play, you know, you have to try and captivate them or, you know, entice them, you know, with your playing in some way, you know, that's our job, you know, as performing artists, you know, because right. we're yeah. performing for an audience, a public audience who mostly probably doesn't have that much knowledge of classical music. Mm -hmm. um, so, And um, in addition to that, I find that, we as artists, and I'm, and I'm trying to incorporate this in my recitals too, is to educate the audience on what we're performing because, we, of course, we want to invite them to see more of what we're working on too, right? But if we're not portraying them, if we're not explaining this difficult music, that would be common knowledge to us, but maybe for someone who may not uh, know of Brahms mm -hmm. or Mahler or Strauss, it's our job. And I find that I think that is like the key uh, for... Uh, successful classical musicians in the future is just educating the audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's very important to try and educate the public uh, on classical music. I mean, that's why they have you know programs at all the concerts. You know, especially like BSO concerts. It was, it's funny actually, because um, I whenever I was at Tanglewood, um, I actually spent a lot of time like reading uh, the program notes because the BSO does like a really great job of like giving you like key information about whatever piece they're playing. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, it's like a lot of really um, useful facts, which is helpful for the audience. So, and also it's good for people who uh, aren't good at public speaking like I am. Um, <laughs> so that's why I created this podcast. So you're not speaking to a thousand people. Mm -hmm. You may, a thousand people may be listening, mm -hmm. but you're just talking to me. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Great. So Nate, uh, a couple more questions because we are running out of time here for people who are new to classical music and are coming across this podcast for the first time. Mm -hmm. 
what are three pieces, top three classical music pieces that you encourage today's audience to listen to that, you know, you're stuck on an island and this is the holy grail of music. What would you bring to that island? Oh, man, that's such a loaded question, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would say first and foremost, because I'm biased and I'm a cellist, the cello suites by Bach. (laughs) <laughs> that's a given because um, uh, for cellists that is our bible and you know it c- can be interpreted in so many different ways um, so definitely the cello suites for sure um, I see and, mm, <laughs> such a loaded question um, let's see I would probably say Another one would probably be Daphnis and Chloe, suite number two. That's a good piece. <laughs> and, you, and you know me. I'm not a huge fan of Ravel. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to make that public. <laughs> I'm not afraid to make that public. And people who I've talked to about this, I don't care. <laughs> but Daphnis and Chloe is, in fact, mm. a great piece. So, yeah, good choice. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's uh, a piece that I have a very strong emotional connection with. Um, so definitely Daphnis and Chloe for sure. Um, and uh, I'm going to stay away from cello repertoire because I don't want to be too biased. Um, you know what? Beethoven 5, you know? I know it's overplayed a bunch, and, you know, every orchestra plays it numerous times, and also, nah, I don't care. It's, it's a great piece, and that's, you know, a staple in the classical repertoire. So, yeah, definitely Beethoven 5. Sure. Or any Beethoven, honestly, for that matter. <laughs> Excellent. Um, last question, and... What was the one moment in your life where you were like, okay, music is going to be my life? And um, and I want you to be real honest with me mm-hmm. for, for the listeners here. Because there, there comes a point in every artist's life and every musician's life where they're like, you know, I don't know if music's for me. Mm-hmm. And every artist struggles with that question. Mm-hmm. Am I good enough? to make it in this world as a musician? Mm -hmm. Am I, like, not good enough to get into an orchestra or create a string quartet or, you know, play for an audience? Mm -hmm. What what keeps you going besides the... um, besides knowing the composers and studying the music? Like, what keeps you going inside? Or, uh, better yet, what was that one moment Mm -hmm. in your life where you're like, okay, like, I am meant to do this? Mm -hmm. Like, cello is the one thing that is going to keep me going for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, honestly, I would have to say when I won the concerto competition. Recently. Yeah. Recently, yeah. When I won the concerto competition at Boko. um, I mean, I got into cello playing. um, I mean, I was first exposed to it when I was like five, uh, because I was I was watching Sesame Street, and uh, of course, famous Yo Yo Ma, Sesame Street. Yeah, like Yo Yo Ma comes on Sesame Street, you know, plays opening on Dvorak Concerto for Elmo, and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Like, I want to I want to do that. Um, But as far as like a career is concerned, honestly, it was when I won the concerto competition and when I played Elgar Concerto with the orchestra. um, I think that was validation for me um because to be totally honest uh, um i had questioned myself a lot um especially during my undergrad at boko too i really questioned myself a lot about you know is this really like what i'm supposed to be doing with my life like is there something more or better you know i hate to say better but is there you know something better out there for me um and it was a struggle i'm gonna be honest it was a struggle but um when i won the concerto competition and i played that concert um I remember walking off stage like, yeah, I was meant to do this. This this makes me happy. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's it's because I can express myself in a way that, I mean, and for all the listeners that are listening, I know this is going to sound so cheesy. Believe me, I know it's going to sound so cheesy. But, you know, for me, cello is a way for me to express my true feelings without words. Because, you know, you don't really have words sometimes for me a lot of times and you know when I'm playing cello I can really just you know open myself up and make myself vulnerable essentially which you know I'm not comfortable doing Um, but I do it because you know it's you know I feel human you know I feel comfortable like that 
Um, so that's what keeps me going because it helps me to stay true to myself and who I am. Nate, I want to thank you for uh, spending some time with me, and um, I'm probably going to see you at a gig real soon. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. Thank you for all the advice that you've given to our existing listeners and our new listeners, and for the people who um, are just joining, uh, we we encourage you to, to subscribe to the Everyday Musician podcast, where I get to talk to everyday musicians doing amazing things like Nate. And uh, for the existing listeners... I encourage you to share it. You know, Nate has a great story, and the people who have been on the podcast so far have amazing stories, and there will be more amazing stories to come. So, you know, p- click the subscribe button. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Um, speaking of social media, where can people find you, Nate, online? Uh, as of right now, I'm on Instagram. Uh, my tag is ntaylor underscore cello. Uh, you can just type in Nathaniel Taylor cello on Instagram. I'm sure it'll come up. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not a very consistent Instagram poster, just letting you know now, but I do, uh, post as much as I can. Um, and I think I have some decent content. <laughs> uh. This is just for people to get to know you better, to get to, to start liking you, to get to see what Nate does outside of cello. Mm. And, uh, I know you've been hitting the gym. I know I've been hitting the gym too, trying to, trying to get that, trying to get that iron. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. And, um, Absolutely. and then, yeah, subscribe everybody and we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us on the Everyday Musician Podcast. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcast platforms. This week's episode was brought to you by Bandzoogle, an online website created by musicians for musicians. Sign up today for a free trial using the link in the podcast notes. The Everyday Musician Podcast was created by Eric Brugala. Music for the Everyday Musician Podcast was created by Ionix Music. I'm your host, Eric Brugala. Join us next week for another episode of The Everyday Musician.